Uh, I'm S. Wiering and I'm Professor in Developmental Psychopathology here at UCL. Are there such a thing as psychopath kids? Well, I don't think scientists or clinicians would feel comfortable calling a child psychopath because psychopathy is an adult personality disorder. But similarly, you do not get a personality disorder as a birthday present when you turn 18. So there are clearly children who have these sorts of traits manifest from an early age. And uh, and it's called callous unemotional. Can you tell me about that? So callous unemotional traits were a term coined by uh, Paul Frick in the United States who was first to study these sorts of core psychopathic traits in children. So these are traits such as lack of empathy and lack of guilt for the uh, bad deeds that you may have done. And how, <laughs> in children, how would it manifest? Uh, well, one of the really awful ways in which you can pick up these sorts of traits in children is if you observe them being cruel to animals or other children, often in, in quite horrible, violent ways. Well, I think uh, in, during our research we often ask these children as part of the experimental setup how they feel about uh, certain transgressions that we ask them to imagine somebody may uh, do and these children often report not really feeling bad about what they've done and not feeling concern for the victims and they often talk about the um, violence in terms of the consequences to themselves, so privileges that they may have lost, for instance, and not in terms of the consequences to the victim who's been badly hurt. It's quite startling, really, isn't it? It is extremely startling, and it is this lack of very basic human quality that is so disconcerting. Any story that stood out to you? I think that the sort of, I mean, the cruelty, mm. to, uh, cruelty to animals, these sort of stories of somebody really disemboweling their pet and just saying, well, I was just interested in what was inside. I was just interested to see the pet squealing. I mean, that is really something that it's very hard to imagine, especially if you've owned pets yourself. It is. So a kid told you this? Yes. Wow. And how common is this? It's not very common. So um, we know that uh, antisocial behaviour in children um, diagnostically only happens in about 3 to 5% of children. And these children are a smaller subset of children who have childhood antisocial behaviour. Uh, so they probably are less than 1% of the population. But the interesting thing is that they are the individuals who commit the most severe and persistent kind of antisocial behaviour throughout the lifespan. So the reason we're interested in them, even though they're small in number, is that they really cause more than their fair share of havoc. Are they born this way? Well, nobody is really born <laughs> a certain way, but they are most probably born with the predisposition to be this way. So our own work um, with twins that uh, estimates heritability of these sorts of traits has shown that these traits are very strongly heritable. So there is genetic vulnerability to these traits, of course, whether they then manifest as a full-blown antisocial behaviour or psychopathy is probably conditioned by environmental factors as well. When you say it's highly heritable, do you mean there's such a thing as a, a psychopathic family? No, what I mean highly heri heritability, it's a population statistic. It refers to how much individual variation is driven by variation in genes. So highly heritable means that a lot of the variation in that particular trait or disorder is driven by genetic variation. And of course, if something is highly heritable, you will see families where there are concentrations of these sorts of traits. And we do know from epidemiological studies that there are certain families where antisocial behaviour really seems to be ongoing from one generation to the next. Would that explain some of the criminal families from the past or even currently? Most, most probably, uh, at least uh, some of them are, are part of the behaviour that occurs in those sorts of families. And did you say you've got some candidate genes? or you've some Well, our group hasn't done uh, candidate gene work, but there has been candidate gene research showing that genes that confer low emotional reactivity, so the kind of genes that make you more likely to show low baseline empathy and emotional reactivity may be involved in development of these traits. So it is a problem with empathy. What is going on in the brain? So we think that the problem that individuals with psychopathy have is with a particular type of empathy, what we like to call affective or emotional empathy. 
So they are very poor at feeling for other, what other people are feeling in situations that may distress somebody else, for instance. They are good at knowing what other people are thinking, so the more cognitive empathy seems to be intact in them, and we think that this may explain why they're so good at manipulating other people. So if you're good at knowing what makes somebody tick, but you don't really care if you make them distressed, then you have the tools for using and abusing other people. Yeah, so individuals with psychopathy don't seem to emotionally resonate with other people. So when they see other people feeling sad or other people feeling scared, they simply don't seem to get the gist of what that other person is feeling. They don't feel aroused to that other person's emotional pain. But they understand it. I think on a conceptual level they understand it. But that is not the same as feeling it, which is what most of us do naturally. I mean, just to give you, I mean, I can give you a slight example. So I used to test uh, prisoners um, uh, who had high levels of psychopathy in a secure prison setting. And one of the tasks we were using was showing them faces of other people looking scared or looking sad or looking happy. And these individuals had particular difficulties in recognizing the fear expression. So when we showed the faces, morphing from neutral face to fearful face, they just took much longer getting that the face is fearful. And interestingly, one of them could not even name fear. He was trying to be helpful to me, however, and he said, well, I don't know uh, you know what this emotion is, but people look that look like that just before I stab them. So there was this complete disconnect between somebody displaying this fearful face and any kind of empathy towards what that person might have been going through. He might as well have just been talking about buying a loaf of bread or something. How extraordinary. Is there a part of the brain in these people, is there a part of the brain that doesn't work? There's a brain region called amygdala that is very important for processing emotions, are very important when we want to learn about significant events in our environment, such as what is making somebody else feel uncomfortable or distressed. And that particular brain region does not seem to activate normally in individuals with psychopathy. So when they are scanned, uh, doing tasks where they have to learn from punishments, their amygdala does not activate the punishments. When they scanned, looking at faces that are scared, the amygdala does not activate to those faces. Typically developing individuals' amygdala lights up like a candle when you show them uh, pictures of scared faces or when you give them tasks where they anticipate punishment. So tell me, what, you've actually scanned these kids and what did you find? So we've now done a couple of scanning studies with these children using different type of emotional stimuli and we find exactly the same type of results that are seen in adult psychopaths. So children who have antisocial behaviour and high levels of callous and emotional traits show low amygdala reactivity to other people's fear and also to the kinds of scenarios that normally elicit empathy in people. How young are these kids? So the children we're scanning are between 10 and 15 years old. Is this the first time kids this young have been looked at this way? Uh, this is the first time that anyone has looked at children who have conduct problems and callous and emotional traits and who are of this age range. People have looked at some older children before. And, um, you know, you'd think it's an empathy deficit, right? And I know this confused me a little while ago. So is something like Asperger's. Yes. Surely they're the same thing? No, it's very... The empathy deficit we see in individuals with psychopathy and individuals with autism spectrum disorders seems very different. So individuals with autism spectrum disorders have difficulty in understanding what other people think, and they're not that interested in social stimuli. However, if you get them to pay attention to emotional, and inf emotional information, they get very aroused by it, and they feel very distressed at other people's distress provided they're paying attention to it. Uh, in quite the opposite way, individuals who have psychopathic tendencies or callous and emotional traits are not very tuned into how other people are feeling, but they're very good at knowing what other people are thinking. So it's different types of empathy that seem to be disrupted in individuals with autism spectrum disorder and individuals with psychopathy. So, so he's saying that they, these kids, they, they literally never feel someone's emotional pain. 
this is that the research seems to suggest that these children are incapable of feeling other people's emotional pain. They never experience it, so I guess what? There's no feedback. Well, one of the theories um, that is floating there is that these children are not able to understand other people's emotional pain because they do not really feel emotional pain themselves. They more fear less. Uh, they are less likely to be sad, and it's it's well known that adults, for instance, who have psychopathy are less likely to have anxiety disorders, less likely to have depression. So it seems that the emotional landscape that these children and also the adults um, with these types of traits have is, is sort of half dead, if you like. Yeah, it's like their brains are developing in a different world. It's like their brains are def- developing in a different way, um, and in a way that may under favourable conditions have some advantages as well as disadvantages. But still, I mean, if you're a a mother and... Can you imagine being a mother to one of these kids? Um, I can imagine it, but the imaginary play soon becomes extremely uncomfortable. So uh, most of us who do have children know that um, interacting with the children is all about reciprocity and you like showing them your love and you like feeling the love back from the children and if your child acts in a way that upsets you you try and do some empathy induction to make them know that what they've just done has made you or somebody else upset and if your child wasn't responding and resonating in an emotionally appropriate way I can imagine that that would be extremely scary as a parent. Yeah and and nothing you can't run away. Obviously you can't um, give your child back your child is with you for life and you are probably faced with the situation where you have to try and figure out parenting tools that are quite uncommon and that most people don't don't have to uh, face. <laughs> and do you think you can help or change these help these mothers help these kids? I think I mean there is some promising new research suggesting that these children do reward do, do res- these children do respond to rewards. So even if they are not so responsive to punishment, and even if you can't really use empathy induction with them, you can probably use some techniques to modify their behaviours and socialise them in a way that is acceptable to the society. So it's not all lost? I, I don't think it's all lost by any means. <laughs>